The challenge for you is you have 50 years before you wind up looking like me. And what are you going to do with your 50? Who are you going to be? How much work are you going to get done? Where are you going to go? What are your experiences going to be? You can't just draw cartoons. You can't just be an artist. You have to have a life. And we can go past the 50 now. Uh, the life my mother envisioned for me, she wanted me to be a doctor. This was my idea of being a doctor. And I knew it wasn't right. So I decided to go to art school because I thought, that's where the girls are. Why else would I go to art school? So I went to art school. And I met Pearl and Marie Therese and another Therese right here and Joe and Frida and Georgia. Isn't she amazing? And woman number one <laughs> by de Kooning. I don't know her name, and maybe I don't want to. Maybe you don't want to either. But this keeps changing, or is it me? Am I getting too close? And so, but it wasn't just painting I was looking at in art school. I was passionate about photography. This is Diane Arbus's amazing twins series. I always hear her called Diane, but I knew her slightly. And she was Diane, not Diane. You know her work? Everybody know Diane Arbus or Diane Arbus? Yeah, you do. Every, anyone else? Incredibly famous photographer of the 20th century. And almost more famous now that she's not alive in the 21st century. Uh, and you should look up her work, Diane Arbus. Diane Arbus. And, but it wasn't just, it wasn't just photography that I was interested in, it was film. Uh, that became a big part of my experience is going to the movies. And I don't mean renting a film, I mean going to the movies. And the faces I saw in the movies really kind of jump-started a, a passion in me to draw faces. And Marilyn, Takashi Shimura, great Japanese star, Akiro, this photo was taken from Akiro, and he was uh, the star of Seven Samurai movie. And John, and James, and Dylan, my favorite poet when I was in my 20s, and Dylan, the other Dylan, who, if you don't know, took his name from the first Dylan. And I love those photos. And it wasn't just film, it was music. And so here's Billy and Ella. These are great photos, aren't they? And Satchmo, also known as Louis. I'm wondering if you actually know who all these people are. Mm, yeah. And of course, Henri, Matisse, looking very soigné, right? And here he is working in his studio. He got really close to the model. Do you get this close to the model when you have life drawing? Yeah. But look how serious he is. How relaxed she is and how serious he is. Like that. Uh, and the next one is Willem de Kooning in his studio. You know who de Kooning is? Great abstract expressionist of the 1950s. That's him in his studio. He's got a cigarette and a broken chair, Jackson Pollock in his studio. I went to Jackson Pollock's studio a couple of months ago on Long Island in East Hampton, and they've saved the studio. And after he died, his wife, Lee Krasner, also an abstract painter, put down masonite panels on the floor to cover the floor, which had been covered with paint. And she painted in there until she died like 30 years later. Jackson Pollock died in 1956. And when they restored this building 
the Pollock Krasner Foundation, it's called. They restored the building that pulled up the masonite panels, and they discovered the floor was a giant Jackson Pollock. That there was paint all over. It was spread everywhere. There was streaks and spots, and you're standing there, and you don't know what to do. You're standing on a Pollock. It's just fantastic. And you can almost see a little bit of it there. Look at him, he's working, he's dripping. And he used house paint. He would use house paint, he'd mix it with whatever, turpentine or some other poison, and he put it in an empty coffee can, and he just would drizzle it. It was fantastic. And here's Lucian Freud coming into his studio. He's just done a portrait of David Hockney, another fantastic painter. By the way, look at that studio. I've always thought if I could get into that picture, I would hand him a broom. And he'd probably hit me with it because cleaning that studio and those paint rags, which look like they're sheets, is not the man's priority. His priority was making these pictures and he was a powerful painter. I love this photo. And here's Max, Max Beckman, one of my favorite painters when I was in art school. And here's a Velasquez painting that I just love. This thing is, there's one of them in New York at the Metropolitan Museum, and the other is at the Prado in Madrid. And they're just spectacular. He obviously loved this guy because he painted him twice. Uh, he was a court dwarf. Uh, forgive me, his name slips my mind. But you know, it was 500 years ago. You can't keep that stuff in your head. Uh, but what a powerful painting. What dignity that face has. And The Postman by Van Gogh. All of these faces were part of my experience. I haven't showed you any of my work, I think, except the doctor picture. Um, I find it less interesting than looking at all this stuff. The important thing for me was that this stuff became part of my experience. The looking at art, looking at photography, looking at architecture, looking at film, looking at living some kind of life. All of that is what you need if you're going to be uh, something. You can't just live a life sitting at a desk, I can tell you. And let's go on to the next one. This is Allen Ginsberg. I went to art school during the 1960s. And it was a time of turmoil in this country because of the civil rights movement, because of the war in Vietnam, which began in 1965. And the 60s were, it was just an uproar the whole time. And did I mention drugs? And it was a time of uh, everybody smoking grass and taking LSD. It had its benefits, you know, the 60s. There were those good moments. Um, Allen Ginsberg, the poet, was a big part of the counterculture then. Here's something else from the 60s. John F. Kennedy and his daughter Caroline. Uh, John F. Kennedy, you probably know, was uh, murdered in 1963. And this picture of Martin Luther King, who was extraordinary. I heard him speak on a couple of occasions, and I think about it now, it gives me the chills. Think about uh, Reverend King, how extraordinary he was. He was shot and killed in 1968. And Robert Kennedy was shot and killed a couple of months later in the kitchen of a hotel in Los Angeles after he made a victory speech when he won the California primary uh, for president, Democratic uh, nomination for president. And the po politics of the 60s helped form my political outlook, and my political outlook helped form the kind of art I was going to do for the next couple of decades. And I show you this because it's, I'm not able to separate these events from my art training or my life. They are my life. 
I could even say that our most recent Nobel Prize winner has played on a lot of the soundtrack of my life. When you get to a certain point, you're gonna know what I mean. You have a soundtrack in your head, and you say, yeah, I lived my life, and the sound of that decade was Bob Dylan, or Louis Armstrong, or something even more crazy. But, yeah, Robert Kennedy. And, but the 60s ended with this. Apollo 10 went to the moon. They didn't land. That was going to be Apollo 11 the next summer. Apollo 10 uh, arrived at the moon on Christmas Eve. NASA set it up that way. They said, oh, no, we didn't set it up. It's just a coincidence. It's when we wanted it, you know, uh, when we had the window to, uh, uh, for liftoff and to get there. But uh, the 1968, the year of those assassinations I just showed you, uh, ended with uh, three astronauts orbiting the moon. So it was kind of beautiful in a way. It's a, it was a hopeful note. And this is a photograph that they took on their orbit around the moon. Nothing fake. It wasn't done in a studio. You know, and, and as they always say, the, uh, there are people who believe the uh, moon landings never happened. This is it, and uh, and that's us over there. You see, we're in there somewhere. And I wonder what that is. So, and that's when they nicknamed the Earth the Big Blue Marble. Did you ever hear that? Big Blue Marble. That's just a wonderful thing. It's what the astronauts thought it looked like from space, from really far away. It's a beautiful photo, and this is Jasper Johns. The end of the decade of the 1960s, he painted these three flags. You know who Jasper Johns is? Terrific painter. Um, and this is Abraham Lincoln. I think it's Abraham Lincoln. Am I wrong? Is there, is there anyone else who ever looked like this? I don't think so. This is the most unusual looking man. Look at that face. Look at that tie. And those eyes, right? Almost, almost colorless eyes. And it feels like, uh, like he's looking right through you. Let's go on to the next one. This is something that uh, if you go to Washington and if you go to the Lincoln Memorial and you look up on one wall and you're going to see the Lincoln's second inaugural address from 150, 151 years ago, 1865. And in it, you can read this. He ref says, the mystic chords of memory. I know you're reading it. Chorus of union, and again, touched as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. And I am showing you this because we could use a little of this right now. We could use a little uh, consciousness of the mystic chords of memory, of what it means to be a citizen of this country, and a shared history, even if we didn't get here when that history happened. My ancestors did not have slaves. My ancestors did not kill the Indians. They, my ancestors were being chased across Europe by Cossacks, and uh, before, probably because they stole the Cossacks' horses. My, my guess is my ancestors were all horse thieves, but I can't prove it. But anyway, they weren't here. But I take some responsibility for this because for all of those things that I mentioned, for slavery, for the Indians, for whatever happened, because I'm an American, the history of this country is important to me. So we need right now to find a way to heal after this election that's coming up. Three more days, four more days, four more days. Right? Is anyone here going to vote? Raise some hands. Right. Right. Is your stomach like churning every night? Is you, are you waking up in the cold sweat with nightmares? Are you uh, thinking that one or the other has been elected? A friend of mine called me yesterday and he said he woke up at four in the morning with his heart beating hard from a nightmare that Donald Trump did. 
president. I laughed, that was so funny, but what's, what's not funny is we're all having that dream. And so what we want is to get the better angels of, uh, I mean, Lincoln said it so well, he was talking about the Civil War. That was a real war. A lot of people died in that war. This is not, we can get over what we're going through right now. Let's have the next. Anyway, after all that, it's a doggy. It's, I love those dogs. This was an ad for something, but I just put it up here because I wanted to tell you I was, after getting out of art school, after uh, all the uh, riots in the street and the demonstrations against the Vietnam War, after all the mm, substances that I accidentally inhaled or swallowed or smoked, uh, I started sniffing around. See, it's a joke. I started sniffing around for something to do. And that's when I started doing ads. And I'm showing you this not because it's a great illustration. Is this a radio station in San Francisco still? Because I did this for an agency here in San Francisco, and it was a billboard. They used them as billboards all over town. And so they, and they were calling themselves Monster FM, as you can tell by the monster headline. And that was this city back then in the 1970s. I've done close to 3,000 illustration assignments in those 50 years. And this was one of them. It was a lot of fun to do something like that. And uh, I'd been to San Francisco a few times. I had a sense of what I wanted to do. But uh, I had to go to books to find the pictures because, you see, we didn't have the internet. And I couldn't just call them up as we could do now on a phone, right? And I had to find a book with a picture of the Transamerica building. By the way, is it still called the Transamerica building? Yeah, it's not the Kleenex building or something like that. Good, that's good to know. I wanted something more though. And so, not personally, I wanted something more satisfying than doing ads. And I was looking for a way to express myself in a creative and funny way and a political way. And I found a group of guys who were starting a new humor magazine. I met them in 1969. And they were the, they still are the most brilliant guys I've met in my life. And they drew to them other almost as brilliant writers and artists. And somehow, after six months in April of 1970, March, April, April of 1970, uh, the first issue of the National Lampoon magazine was published. And the Lampoon, the humor of the Lampoon is to me personified by this little cartoon which happened to appear in the Lampoon as part of a make-believe comic strip. And I thought, yeah, that's what we were always doing in every article we did. We were doing something incredibly rude. So uh, here's a few things in the Lampoon. This is, uh, next one is, I did an article which I wrote and drew, I wrote and drew 150 articles for this magazine over 21 years. It was a great creative home for me. This is from my history of medicine. Um, I think I called it the great moments in medicine. This is the invention of the tongue depressor. Do you know what a tongue depressor is? Invention of the tongue depressor, and uh, and this is not. This is from uh, I made up uh, dinosaurs. I called them the dodosaurs, and I did two dodosaur articles because it was so popular. I did a second one, and then I did a book called the dodosaurs. It was the dinosaurs that didn't make it. The ones we know about are pretty weird, aren't they? Dinosaurs we know about when you look at them, they're pretty strange. What about the ones we don't know about? the ones that weren't as successful in evolutionary terms, those were the dodosaurs. And so this is the Triceratus. And he's armored from behind, but uh, quite vulnerable from the front. 
And this uh, Pelucosaurus over here, uh, big ham-fisted Pelucosaurus is uh, using him as a punching bag, as a speed bag. And I did a whole book of these drawings. I can't tell you how much fun I had. And the idea came from my son, who was five years old, and used to sit on my lap. And in the, uh, in the afternoons, after he got out of nursery school, he'd sit on my lap and he'd say, draw a stegosaurus, draw a triceratops, draw a tyrannosaurus. I mean, after a while, I was getting pretty bored drawing the same animal over and over. I can't tell you how many thousands of times it seemed to me that I was doing these animals. So I began to uh, elaborate. And I thought, well, what if I just move that armor on the triceratops around to the back? What if I continue those fins on the back of a stegosaurus around on the bottom of the stegosaurus? What if I, uh, if I removed one head from the diplodocus? You know, with a big body and a very long tail and a very long head, uh, neck rather, with a little tiny head on it. A head the size of a, a, what, a loaf of bread for an animal that weighs 40 tons. Excuse me, does he really need it? That's what I was thinking, so I drew him with two tails. And some of the animals I drew with two heads. And I called them the dodosaurs. And my son then began to say, let's make some dodosaurs which was much more entertaining than uh, just drawing the dinosaurs that I already drawn a thousand times. So one of the editors of the Lampoon, of the National Lampoon, saw my drawings from my son and said, oh my goodness, we have to do this as an article. And so we did. And it was a little more wicked. I'm not going to tell you some of them. And, and so let's go on to the next one. This is a touching picture. I'm in American folklore. In American folklore, there's Paul Bunyan. Paul Bunyan is a character who cut down all the forests so the wood could be used to make America great. Not again, but the first time. And he cut down, his job was to cut down all the forests. Smokey the Bear's job was to protect all the forests, and I don't know how it came to me, but I was musing over something one day, and I thought, what if they met? Would they get along? And I decided that this is when I feel like a comedian. And then one day I decided, like, um, I decided that it would look something like this. And you might think it's a little bloody, but what would you expect if a grizzly bear and a guy with an axe got together, you know? I think it's, to me, it's real life. And it has some of what, it's not just a cartoon. It's, I tried to make it a really strong drawing, the kind of thing that I went to art school for, to make it like a painting. Is it a painting or is it like a painting? I don't know, it's not a painting, it's a slide. So, I didn't do this. I know some of you thinking, well, oh, he's really good. Um, I didn't do this. Uh, this is the Mona Lisa, but I did the next one. This is the Mona Gorilla. So, Mona Gorilla, not the Monkey Lisa. Anyone who thinks it's the Monkey Lisa will have to leave. I'm sorry. The Mona Gorilla. Uh, I did for a cover of the National Lampoon. We can go to the next one. And it looked like that on the cover of the magazine. And it became an instant hit. And they sold thousands of posters in the early, I think 1971, 1972. I'm still waiting for those royalties. And uh, anyway, it was, uh, it became the mascot of the magazine for the entire life of the magazine. And uh, I got kind of fond of it. And by the way, you want to go back a couple? Yeah, go back to the Mona, yeah. See Mona Lisa? Look at her, she's a little thin. She's very prim, see how prim she is? You go ahead, one. Look at her, how luscious she is, and how sexy, in comparison to that yellow Mona Lisa thing. And she's got a banana. 
Leonardo didn't paint the banana. I don't know. I just want to point that out. I think that maybe you'd want to see the difference here. And the next one is a cover I did for, um, I was asked to do a cover for the magazine. The, uh, it was going to be the March issue. And I said, what's, what's the theme of the issue? And he said, well, you know, March comes in like a lion. I said, enough, stop. In like a lion, out like a lamb. And uh, I thought this would be the cover. And of course, there were many distributors who wouldn't touch it. it. It wound up being one of those issues that the distributor put under a truck somewhere and didn't give out because there are a lot of places in this country where they didn't want things like this on the newsstand. You couldn't do a cover like this now, anywhere. You couldn't do an interior like this where that you would have magazines saying, no thanks, I'm not touching this. By the way, look at that tongue. I'm loving that drool right now. Here's another National Lampoon cover, not by me. This was, this was a very famous cover. And so many subscriptions were canceled because people thought that the dog was really being threatened. Can you imagine a cover like this now on any magazine? It would make people crazy. Um, but it was, I'll tell you a nice thing, it was the photographer's dog and he was very well treated and they didn't kill him. It's just the people who saw the cover thought, this can't be, this shouldn't be, this should never happen. They got just the right shot, didn't they? Let's go on to the next one. Lampoon had great cartoonists in the magazine. And this is uh, Sam Gross and uh, this is one of his a cover for the depression issue. I'm just showing it to you because I think it's funny. Depression. It's a balloon man. So uh, here's Che Guevara. Oh, wait. Sorry. That's John Belushi. Next one, please. Here's Che Guevara. I was confused. Uh, this is a famous photograph by Alexander, not Alexander Corder, a man named Corder who's uh, Cuban, and he made this photograph during the revolution. And uh, Paul, the terrific illustrator Paul Davis made this painting that was on the cover of a magazine called Evergreen Review. And the painting became a sensation. And there were Che posters everywhere. And you've all seen some kind of iteration of this image, which comes from that photograph. The photograph was the original. Or maybe Che was the original, then the photo, then the painting. And the National Lampoon, which didn't take right-wing, raving right-wing lunatics or tie-dyed Vietnam War peaceniks or even tedious nudniks seriously, decided that uh, the veneration of Che Guevara had gone a little too far and they did this cover. So that's the sequence from the photo to the painting to the Lampoon's version of it, the pie in the face. And not stopping at that, they went on and they got Hitler to pose for the cover of the magazine. And, and he did it for very little money. So they did this and they did an article. The theme of the issue was escape. And they did an article inside the magazine of how one man's found peace on a island far out in the sea with just a few natives on it and no one would trouble him at all. And he's just there living his life. And the natives have a story they tell about how this man arrived in a great silver fish one day many years ago and lives on the island now. And here's a picture from the spread inside. It's a, this, this is not the name of it, but I call it, I think of it as Hitler on the beach. And you don't see something like this every day, right? Anyway, we can go on. Here's another Lampoon cover. The theme was heterosexuality. Uh, I, I love the painting. It's a wonderful illustrator did this. And 
The paint, I think it's a terrific painting, but also look at the simplicity of the cover. They were forced to have a barcode. This is one of the first ones that had barcodes. But um, they, the cover is so simple. There's only the title above the uh, name of the magazine, and that's it. And a lot of magazines, when you look at them today, they just filled the type. You don't know what the hell's going on. The design of them can be uh, really messed up. But this one had a simplicity, and the next one does also. This is sports. And this is when the Russians, in you can see the date, 1976, getting ready for the 1976 Olympics. And the, the Russians were being accused of using steroids. So, because their women and the East German women had, you know, huge shoulders and uh, were winning all these events, and including swimming and track and field, and it was the beginning of the idea that steroids, that these people were being steroid enhanced, and sound familiar? It's still happening today. It's 40 years later, and the same thing is relevant today. But you see what they did to her, right? I've always felt a little guilty about this, but this poor woman had to pose there uh, with that thing in her shorts as a, you know, one of the side effects of her uh, steroid use, her testosterone use. So on a lighter note, uh, this cartoon, with famous uh, National Lampoon cartoon, it doesn't have a written caption, it's just that sign on the wall. Can you see it? Is it? Yeah, I love that cartoon. Here's a, I, I like this, it's almost an ad. This, there's the picture, there's the book over there. And this is actual size, the book is just a representation of that. And this was a book I did a few years ago about the writers and artists of the National Lampoon. Nobody had done the book, and I thought, well, what the hell? And I did it, and it only took three years, or as we might say in the Bronx, three effing years, three freaking years to do one book. And it was really something. And looking back on it, I don't know why I did it. It was just an incredible amount of work. But it gave me a uh, chance to get back into that world and meet again and interview all my old friends who were the editors and cartoonists. And um, it was a wonderful connection for me. And there were uh, terrific things in it. And here's something, something I did. Uh, this is American President Lyndon Johnson, LBJ. LBJ. And with the hand lifting him up. And it was a column that I was called the shooting gallery that I ran for a couple of years in the magazine. And there's a reason I did this, and the next one will show you. There's a picture of Lyndon Johnson lifting his beagle by the ears. And I saw that and I thought, oh, that's great. I gotta do Lyndon as the dog being lifted up. And I don't know why I didn't have dog paws lifting him instead of hands, now that I think about it. A little late, I think, 40-something years. I won't revisit it, and we don't need to revisit LBJ anymore either. Let's go on to the next one. There was a, a president named Richard Nixon, and he was president from 1968 to 1974. And afterwards, in retirement, he supposedly was playing the piano in the basement of his rec room. And there was, this was an off-Broadway play, and this was the poster for the off-Broadway play. It was called The Basement Tapes. And uh, my favorite part of this, aside from the fact that his ear is, that he has no head behind his hairline, and his ear is like the Holland Tunnel. You know what the Holland Tunnel is? Well, it's in New York. Anyway, the, uh, but I did the title in tape which was a lot of work, but was a lot of fun also to do that. And you know that's drawing. You do lettering, you're drawing the lettering. There's a great deal of fun doing it. 
Um, and the next one is President Ronald Reagan. Anyone remember Ronald Reagan? Um, I think it's a really tender view of President Reagan. And it was from an article I did, the uh, Ronald Reagan ABCs, which I did 26 drawings of Reagan. Um, and forgive me, but I'm unprepared. I forgot which letter this was. Uh, but I want you to know he's not threatening the Pakistani prime minister. The, the little piece I wrote about it is he's trying to sell that missile to him. That's really what it was about. But you can see how transgressive you could be in a situation like that where anything goes in the magazine. Nothing I ever did in 21 years was rejected. Everything I proposed to them, they said, great, how many pages do you want? And I would say, uh, three. And they'd say, how about five? They wanted to, they thought it was a good idea. They wanted to fill space. They wanted more of me in the magazine. It was incredible. And it's finding a home, a conceptual and artistic home, is really a great thing in your lives if that happens for you. And we were able to take this every different direction at the National Lampoon. And the next one, this is a quote from George Bush. This is an actual quote. You can find this online. Where wings tape dream. Families is, families is where our nation finds hope, where wings take dream. Who misses George Bush? Come on. We could have a lot more. You know, the thing with Obama is he never said anything incredibly dumb. And, but, but George Bush did. And so, uh, and this is a drawing by Robert Grossman, a wonderful illustrator, and which I thought kind of goes with that quote. Let's have the next one. Uh, this is a quote from Newt Gingrich. There's a sleaze ball. Uh, well, I drew him as a newt, as a slimy newt with, uh, this is just, this is just uh, four years ago, 2012. And I just tried to make him look, I wanted the viewer of this, and there were a lot of viewers who was posted online. I wanted the viewer to see the inner corruption of the man to see the outer corruption of the man. And I tried to make him as sleazy and corrupt looking as possible because I wanted you when you see this thing to go, Hoo! or maybe, ah. Is there another representation I can give? Yeah. Because um, I look at that and I think, yeah. And this, you know, he couldn't, he was always putting his foot in his mouth. What a hypocrite. There's another drawing, or hippo something. Anyway, uh, the next. Um, now here's a quote. This is a series of quotes from taken right out of Twitter. I think you probably know who said this. And so we go on to the next picture. This is a drawing of Donald Trump by, the, by America's greatest caricaturist of the 20th century, David Levine. Uh, and he was not only an incredible draftsman, and he had such skill with likenesses, he never, ever missed. And uh, he was also the most literate man. I knew him pretty well. He was an incredibly literate guy, so well read. And he did this in 1988 of Donald Trump. And look, he put a diaper on him. So what does that say? Even back then, 1988, this is how he was viewed to uh, satirist, caricaturist. This is how he looked. This is how he looked to most of us. Those of us from New York City. New York, uh, I just read some polls. There's a possibility of uh, Hillary Clinton getting 70% of the vote in New York City and 60-something in New York State overall. That means in the city Donald Trump lives in, only 30% of the people think he's worth voting for. And probably half of those can't stand Hillary, so they're going to vote for him because fuck it. 
And, but this is how he's viewed and by the people who know him best, which is saying something, I think. And, but look at that diaper. I mean, it's also very subtle. I don't know, does that work? Did anyone see the diaper? Yeah, okay. Before I mentioned it, I mean, 1988. So, uh, and this is a quote from Hillary. These are all real quotes. What, it is, what is it he alone can fix? And so we have a picture of Hillary. A terrific artist, Philip Burke. Uh, another great artist, you know who he is? Yeah, Philip Burke's drawing of Hillary. I, I think with all that exaggeration, all that crazy color, he really just looks exactly like this woman. This woman is brilliant and resilient and flawed and she has great stamina and it's time, it's time. The Cubs just won the World Series after 114 years. It's been 96 years since, the women, since women got the vote in this country, 96 years. And this is the first time that a woman was a, somehow made it far enough to run for president. And I think a lot of the negativity about her in this particular election season is because of her sex, not because of her views. And, uh, you know, hey, I'm voting for the woman. That's all. You hear it in my voice. I, there's no doubt, right? Let's go on. Here's a great quote. This is a quote I just love. She was speaking to a group of, uh, I don't know, Jewish people. And she said that. And here's a drawing. I was asked to draw her for the New York Times. I drew her, this was a few years ago, I drew her as Amy Winehouse. And um, they tried to take my gun away and I said, no, no, no. Um, so it was a combo thing. Look at her tattoo. Jesus is my daddy. That's pretty good. And on her other arm, abstain. I don't know what it means, but it's kind of funny. Uh, just one of those quick illustrations. Um, that quote about Barack Obama, I just inserted the uh, uh, Sarah Palin, but the quote about Barack Obama uh, had me do this sketch. When I read that, I did this sketch. There was a lot of talk about him not being uh, Christian, he was a Muslim, he was really a Muslim, he was a secret Muslim, and uh, Israel had a prime minister named Ehud Barak. The same spelling as Barack Obama. If you go to Israel, you're gonna meet a lot of people whose names are Barak. It means Baruch, and Baruch is, means blessing. And it's very common in the uh, Islamic world, and it's very common in the, uh, in the uh, Israel. And so I decided to draw, the name of this was Baruch Obama, or the Baruch Obamas. And I drew him as a Hasid, Hasidic Jew, and there's Michelle. And in this picture they have, I don't know, 12 children. And they're in Brooklyn shopping for groceries. And I presented it to the New Yorker. And they looked at it and said, <laughs> they said, uh, uh, thank you, but no thank you. Actually, they loved it, but they weren't going to use it because it's a lampoon idea. And they're the New Yorker, and they just couldn't do it. It, was, it had too much something that they didn't want. But I was really happy I did it because at least I have this right now. So this next guy, anyone know who this is? The Ayatollah Khomeini. Ayatollah Khomeini was the founder of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, 1978 or 79, 79 I think, they overthrew the Shah of Iran. Um, and they, uh, they formed this government there, which is still in power. 
he's no longer alive, but when he was alive, this was his face. And by that I mean, you can go online, you will never see a photo of him smiling or laughing. There's, he never had another face but this. A glowering face. <laughs> You didn't want to be near this man. You thought he, you know, spittle on his beard. Um, I mean, just going in and out, I'm sorry about that. But uh, um, anyway, I decided if I was going to draw him, I would draw him doing something that he'd never done before. And so I drew him laughing. I thought, nobody's ever seen that before. The Ayatollah never laughed in his life. Look at him. He's laughing his head off in this picture. And this is, remember that lion I showed you? He had a beautiful tongue. I think I have a minor in tongues. Some people speak in tongues. I draw in tongues. And I thought as long as I was opening his mouth and making him laugh, I'd give him this, a set of the worst teeth that I could possibly think of. Because it, it's uh, like a voodoo doll. I wanted to give him a toothache. And so I drew these teeth. How much fun was that? You see, part of this work shouldn't be work. It should be fun. You should be sitting there, if you're doing something, laughing to yourself, saying, this is great, or this is funny, or this is a joy. And that should be part of your creative process. It shouldn't be, I'm in pain, I wish I was dead, I wish I wasn't doing this. It should be, I love this thing. And anyway, I loved that thing. And the next one, this is a, a drawing I did a couple of years ago of Salman Rushdie. Salman Rushdie is a really well-known author. Um, and he wrote a book in the 80s. Uh, now, it might have been the late 80s. And the book was called The Satanic Verses. And in it, there, right, he was born in Pakistan, and uh, Salman Rushdie, uh, to a uh, Muslim family. And in it, he had some characters that talked about uh, Islam. And someone in Iran took offense at this, and they told the Ayatollah. And the Ayatollah said, what? He wrote, what? And he said, fatwa time. It's fatwa time. Everybody know what a fatwa is? Oh, give me a break. You don't know what a fatwa is? You can order one. There's a place down the street that sells them. The, they're great. They come with drippy gravy and stuff. Now, a fatwa is an order from a high religious authority, and he was the highest in Iran, that either, that usually it's uh, about punishment. And in this case, he put a fatwa on Salman Rushdie. And the fatwa said, said, we can go on to the next one. By the way, if you look at a photo of Salman Rushdie, Rushdie he really looks like that. That was a good caricature. It says, I'm informing all brave Muslims of the world that the author of the satanic verses, a text written, edited, and published against Islam wasn't the prophet of Islam and the Quran, along with all the editors and publishers aware of its contents, are condemned to death. Nice guy. I call on all valiant Muslims, wherever they may be in the world, to kill them without delay so that no one will dare insult the sacred beliefs of Muslims henceforth, and whomever is killed in this cause will be a martyr, Allah willing. And this fatwa caused Rushdie to go into hiding. He was protected by the British for many years because his home was in London. And the British had him basically in prison because they didn't want him killed. And after, I think it was a dozen years, um, he came to the United States when a deal was reached with the British and the Iranian government to lift the fatwa. It wasn't actually lifted, but it was put on hold. So Salman Rushdie 
is alive in this country. He goes to, you know, he reads uh, at book readings. He appears at all kinds of events. He's, uh, a, he's a free man now. He's free from being killed by the order of one old nasty reprobate who made this order. They, and the Iranian government said, we can't lift this order. We can't lift it. Only the Ayatollah can lift it, and he's dead. So they couldn't lift it, but what they said is, well, we, we won't encourage anybody to do anything about it. Now, I've met Salman Rushdie a bunch of times. He's been in my house, and in the back of my mind was, uh-oh, somebody gonna come through the door with a machine gun to kill this man because they think the fatwa is still uh, active. Fatwa, F-A-T-W-A-H, or maybe uh, no H. Look it up. And it's not just this, there are many fatwas on all kinds of things for all kinds of reasons. So, this is a painting by Rene Magritte. It says, uh, nez, and uh, this is not a pipe. I had the great pleasure of taking my nephew to Museum of Modern Art a few months ago, and we stood in front of this, and he said, I don't get it. And I said, what does it say? And he says, it says this isn't a pipe. I said, well, it isn't. He said, what do you mean? He said, it is a pipe. I said, it's not a pipe, it's a painting. And he said, ah, the light dawned on a 16-year-old boy. It's not a pipe. And Rene Magritte gave this a name. The name of the painting is not, this is not a pipe. The name of the painting is The Treachery of Images, which is really cool when you think about it. Because you're looking at it and you say, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's a pipe. Mm -hmm. Treachery of Images. It's a painting of a pipe. So I found this really funny thing on the internet. Next. This is not a pipe, and this is not Muhammad. Somebody did this parody. And of course, it's not Muhammad. It's just some guy with a beard, you know, with a, a turban on his head. But if it was, if, if it said this is Muhammad, it's possible that somebody could come after the person who did this because he's drawn Muhammad. This is a funny time to be a satirist in this world when there are so many threats uh, being made. So the next image, in the city of Istanbul, in Turkey, there's one of the best museums in the world called the Topkapi Museum. And all the great treasures of the Ottoman Empire for 1,200 years wound up in the Topkapi. You must go. Not tomorrow, but one time. You must go. And in the treasure room of this museum filled with Ottoman treasures was a little crystal case uh, made of gold and crystal. And in it were three little, little round balls, like chocolate truffles. And out of each truffle, uh, made of clay, was coming a hair or two of the prophet Muhammad. And it said, hairs from the beard of the prophet. And I couldn't take a picture, no pictures allowed. So I drew it. So, and by the way, how do we know they're from his beard? Right? It could be hairs from someplace else. So anyway. Um, so there they are. Somehow they've saved this for uh, 1,500 years. They've got, they managed to save the hairs from his beard, and they've got them on display. They sell a postcard of it. But I made this drawing. So I made this drawing. Am I under a death sentence for drawing his hairs that are on display and because I drew them? I don't know. Is somebody going to kill me for drawing this? The thing is, the Ayatollah said in his fatwa, that anyone responsible for the book, the publishers, the editors, 
anyone who sees it or helps it along any way should also be killed. So I've shown this to you. Too bad you looked, right? Because now you're all responsible along with me if somebody crazy bursts into the room. Uh, so let's go on to the next one. So I wondered about this. And I've made some paintings of things from other religions that weren't exactly polite. This is the presentation of the bill. Now, you look at it and you're saying to yourself, this is the Last Supper. Well, if I called it the Last Supper, it would be redundant because it is the Last Supper. We know that. What it is is the presentation of the bill. Jesus is holding the bill for the Last Supper in his hand. How many? 50 Bloody Marys. 12 pink ladies, fatted calf, withered fig, everything he's got on the bill. The key to this illustration for me is when Jesus gets the bill, we go on to the next one. Uh, I woke him up. And is the key for me in this illustration was Jesus' face. If it didn't say Jesus F Christ when he looks at the bill, then I didn't have a successful picture, <laughs> right? It had to. And uh, over there, can we go back, Stephen? We go back one. This is Judas, and he's got 30 pieces of silverware in his jacket. So I did this drawing. Did every Catholic per uh, person come rushing me because they wanted to kill me because I drew Jesus? No, everybody draws Jesus. They've been drawing Jesus for 2,000 years. Every church, every stained glass window, every museum is filled with Jesus. And I would go on, we can go past that. Here's the next one. Here's the Madonna. I drew this Madonna uh, for the National Lampoon. I didn't get into trouble for drawing the Madonna. People seem to like it. They think she's cute. And look at the little baby Jesus over there. He's got his halo and stuff like that. So we go on to the next one. And here are the birds of Israel. And I drew this, the birds of Israel. It's a, I made a poster. It was in a magazine, and I made a poster out of it. See, the, all the birds have big beaks, really big beaks. Um, you could take it as insulting, but I know a lot of Jewish people. Nobody came after me and hit me over the head with uh, you know, a, a watermelon or something. This. They thought this was funny. And I sell these prints, and people keep buying them, and almost all the people that buy them are Jews, and, which is fine with me. And it's uh, because they think it's funny, and it's okay to make a joke about their religion and them. Um, and here's God. This is the God of the Christians and the Jews. And I decided to draw him as a petty tyrant, a petty peevish guy, right? I just thought he's always pissed off in the Bible. I don't know if any of you have had a chance to look at the Bible, but he's pissed off. He says to Moses in the last chapter of Deuteronomy, which is the last book of the, uh, uh, the five books of Moses, he says, uh, yeah, come up here. You can come up the mountain over here. And look out there. You see Canaan? You see the promised land? Yeah, you see it? You can't go. Moses says, I, I've been leading my people 40 years through the desert. And God says, you remember 39 and a half years ago in the desert, you buttoned your coat wrong or some other stupid infraction. And God says, I never forgot that. And you're not going into the promised land. And I thought, what a shithead. And so... All right, I'm a non-believer. My father was a non-believer. Um, it was okay for me to do this, but all God-fearing Americans haven't come after me. And this was published and had a kind of wide audience. And people mainly left. We don't take this stuff seriously. We don't kill somebody for drawing something like this. This is Ai Weiwei. Anyone know who Ai Weiwei is? He's, uh, Ai Weiwei is uh, probably China's most famous artist. And 
politically, he, he got in trouble with the government. And uh, they, they arrested, uh, put him under arrest for three months, and then we let him out. They had a gag order on him. He wasn't allowed to meet with Westerners. He wasn't allowed to speak uh, about anything political. And there are a couple of documentaries about him that you should look up because he's a man of extraordinary courage. And I made this drawing in a sketchbook of mine. Um, sketchbook isn't this big. It's uh, actually, I always carry one of these things. A little, uh, it's a book that fits in my pocket. It allows me to have it with me and make a drawing or make a note or a shopping list or anything anytime I want. It's always in my pocket. That means I don't have to carry it or maybe I don't have to leave it home. Or, and I made this drawing of I, and uh, I, I thought that there's a country that should be so sure of itself, that has so much power, has so many productive people, and they're spending their time trying to figure out a way to shut down creativity and political talk. And it seems like a great waste of amazing talent. So I'll tell you a story. I, I've been to China a bunch of times, and I taught in China a few years ago, 2013. I taught in China. And uh, in the documentary about Ai Weiwei, I, he's talking about how much he loved the pastrami at the Carnegie Deli in New York. And so I thought, I'm going to bring him pastrami because the people at the school I was speaking at all knew him. And they said, yeah, great idea, bring him the pastrami. So I went and I bought a pound of pastrami, like $50, a pound of pastrami, and I had them shrink wrap it. And then I bought a loaf of bread, rye bread, and I bought a jar of mustard. I didn't know if they can get deli mustard in China. And I brought it with me to China. And then we found out that I was worried that if we came to visit him, we would get in trouble. Not me so much, but my hosts, who would bring me there. And so we ate the pastrami. And the, my hosts at the school, a bunch of teachers and I sat around, and we ate pastrami one night. And it was pretty damn good. We had to microwave it to fluff it up a little. But poor I never got the pastrami he deserved. Everyone know this guy? So I was going to draw Kim Jong-un. If I was in North Vietnam and I drew Kim Jong-un, they'd probably shoot me to death with an anti-aircraft gun, which is how they do it. But only to important people. And so maybe I wouldn't be that important. But I looked at this picture, and I kept looking at it, and I kept looking at it, and I thought, I can't do it. I can't draw this guy. I can't improve on this. He's already done. The caricature is done. I'm looking at the picture. What, how could I make a drawing of him that was even more of a caricature than this? I feel the same way about Trump. I'm getting, every time I start to draw Trump, it ju I just think, <laughs> he's enough of a cartoon already. I mean, how can I, how can I make a picture of this guy? And anyway, Kim Jong-un, Look, his daddy gave him a country. What did your fathers do for you? I can tell you, my father left me as Chrysler. But, and it worked for a year. Oh, yeah. So, anyway, speaking of meat, I have this photograph. Uh, this is a chacroute, which you get in France or in Alsace. And if you want to get really sick, eat a lot of this. It's, it's one of the great meals in France. And I'm only showing it to you because I came across this postcard the other day, and I thought, oh, that's great. I'm going to scan this. And so here's that. And I'm going to end with, before you start, with this video. I think you're going to have to hit it twice. And the video is of photographs of food that my friend Myra Kalman and I have taken in all the places we visited over the last few years. 
Everybody photographs their food. We made a video of our food. See if you can hit that one more time. So, uh, Russia, China, India, France, Italy, Argentina, Israel, Jordan. Uh, I'm missing a country or two. There were a few, Japan, a uh, bunch of countries. All of that food we ordered. We didn't just photograph it in passing. We ate that stuff. Actually, a couple of times, we just ordered it so we could photograph it. And uh, Myra, who's my companion, she loves to paint this stuff. She'll photograph it, and she'll go home and make a painting of it. And if you look through some of her books, you'll see a lot of paintings of food. Uh, it's funny. Anyway, we had all these photos, and we were looking at them saying, aren't these great? What can we do with this? So we made this silly little thing. Um, anyway, and I think I have uh, one last thing. Yeah, I got this. This is real. I got it in a Chinese restaurant. I think this is, if I'm going to leave you with any philosophy, I think this would be it because it's completely puzzling and you have no idea what the hell it means. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll go to questions if you want. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, so if you want to ask questions, and if not, we can all go home, or wherever you're going. I can't go home. I'm stuck in a hotel here. How did you, oh, how did you first land the job at uh, National uh, Lampoon? Well, it wasn't actually landing the job. I, I met the, I, I mentioned earlier, I met the guys who were starting the magazine. And we became friends, and I began to work with them. I recommended other people to work with them. And it took six months to get that first issue out. And I was part of it from before the beginning. It was just part of uh, who we were. We all kind of worked together in a creative way. And I was really lucky. It didn't have to be like that. I could have ignored it. I could have missed it. All kinds of things could have happened. But these were the smartest guys I ever met in my life. There weren't, uh, my book is called Drunk, Stone, Brilliant, Dead. Well, brilliant describes so many of them. They, uh, it, it's even hard to describe the kind of stuff they knew. And there was an element in that magazine of incredible uh, intellectual, they, they wrote with a kind of, it felt like intellectual fireworks. And there was also the lowest humor, fart jokes. 
and the amazing things where the, somebody parodied the Code of Hammurabi, which was a, an Assyrian uh, legal code from 2,500 years ago. The fact that he even knew it existed, well, it's actually kind of famous in law, law history, but I mean, the parody of it was fantastic. And they had that kind of humor, and the same guy would do some really stupid thing about, as I said, fart jokes in the same issue. That high and low was part of the tension in that magazine that you never knew what to expect. And uh, uh, just to go a little further, nothing, almost nothing that we did in those days for that magazine could be published anywhere now because we have a fear of hurting somebody else's feelings. Now, a lot of these are valid. On the other hand, there's a First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which says, uh, uh, talks about freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law uh, prohibiting uh, freedom of the speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of gathering. We're all gathered here now, but it's not a political gathering. And, and that kind of thing, it can be tamped down if there are too many pressures from every side. If I'm worrying that somebody's going to burst into my studio and shoot me dead for a cartoon I did 10 years ago that I don't even, I don't even remember, or that somebody else is going to burst down the door because they didn't like a photo of a dog I took, um, or maybe I've used a trigger word that made somebody feel unsafe. Um, hey, I saw, uh, I saw a coloring book yesterday in a bookstore in Burbank, and the coloring book was Safe Spaces, and it was for children, for adults to tell them they could huddle safely somewhere in a classroom and not have to listen to what the teacher was saying if the subject disturbed them. I don't, what? And, but it was a coloring book. And I stupidly didn't buy it. Because, I, I mean, that would be an amazing thing to do a parody of right now. But the other question is who would publish that? So I'm just yammering on. You know, I'll, unless you ask me questions, I'll talk all day until he takes the microphone from me. Anything else? You have a follow-up? Do it. You have to take this, though, because I can hardly hear you. Um, basically, like, was uh, when you started doing National Lampoon, was it already, um, did your illustrations make it boom, or did, was it already, um, like, a thing? The, the, lampoon, the Lampoon began with illustrations. They just loved cartoons. They just loved... Uh, funny illustrations and parodies of other things. There's, so we have parody, we have caricature, we have satire. All three mean different things, but they're all related. Um, so they believed in all of it. And every, every one of the first issues was a mishmash of different things. It took a little while for the public to catch on, but at some point, the lampoon caught fire after a few issues. And I mean, it rose like a rocket. Uh, and in a year, was selling about a million copies. And it had something called a pass along. You know what a pass along is? A pass along for a magazine is that you're going to college. You're here in this school. You buy the magazine. You're only one person. One million people do the same thing that you do. Then you pass it on to your friend and he passes it on, and she passes it on, and, then, and 12 people read it. The pass along for the National Lampoon was 12. So one million copies a month, 12 million people read it. And most of the readers were college. And it was incredibly popular then. It was so transgressive. It broke so many rules. It was so rude. It was so funny. I mean, you would laugh out loud all the way through the issue. You couldn't believe you were looking at this stuff. And uh, what we've lost, uh, uh, look, I know it's a long time ago. Remember that 50 I put up 10 times this? That 50? It's a long time ago. 
but we haven't really changed inside, but the culture has changed around us. And we have to find a way to get back to where we have the freedom to draw and paint and write and think the things we want and not feel that I can't draw this. That's part of what I was showing you. To think that you can't paint something or draw something because somebody else might not like it is not the right way to go about being an artist. What you need to do is do it for yourself. You draw and paint for yourself and let them come to you for it and not, not uh, edit yourself out of, your, out of maybe your best ideas, right? This happens. People do it. They say, oh, I can't do that. Nobody, everybody's going to hate this. That's why I did Baruch Obama. You know, I thought, oh, that's funny. I'll make him a Hasidic Jew. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of knew that, no, I definitely knew. I kind of. I knew they weren't going to like it. Uh, I mean, go for it at the New Yorker. But I didn't want to not draw it. I felt like I had to do it. Oh, it take me an hour. So what's the big deal? So I did it. And now you saw it. And I don't know where that takes you. Anyway. Yeah. So, do, you, do you want this? No. My favorite medium? Um, I love, I, I have a, like a collection of pens you wouldn't believe. I could give one to each of you and still have like a hundred left over. And luckily, I don't have them with me, so I don't have to give you any of them. And, but, but um, I love to draw in pen and ink. I love to draw in uh, uh, watercolor and colored pencil. I like gouache. Um, I love paper. If I find sometimes the paper tells me what it wants me to draw with. I feel the texture of the paper. Maybe it's something that I'm not usually using. I use a Fabriano. It's called Fabriano Artistico because I feel artistico. And so I buy Fabriano usually, but sometimes I have another, a Saunders or something like that, and maybe it's a rough surface. And that means that I use a different medium than I might normally use. And each one of these things calls for something else. And the way I treat it, I just love it. And you get bored if you use the same thing all the time. If you're an artist and you have to pick up the same thing, you find a different way to look at things. You know, I broke my uh, a bicycling accident years ago, and I fractured my elbow right here. I was in a cast, and I had a job to. I actually had been in the middle of it. And I couldn't finish it because I was in, in those days, a plaster cast, not one of these kind of fabric and plastic things now, plaster. And so my arm is like this. And I didn't want to not turn the job in because I was pretty far along. So I finished it with my left hand. And I had an epiphany, which was the brain is the same. It's just you're just using the, the other hand. So the ideas don't change. And the, the notion you have of how you want to draw and paint is still it's right up here, not in the hand. Now, of course, it's a little awkward. I'm not saying it's not, but I did it. And uh, I didn't do too many more with my left hand. because, I thought, And you know, you break your arm and you think, uh, maybe that God, that pissed off God I showed you, I think maybe he's telling me something. Maybe I should just take it easy for a few weeks until the cast comes off which I did. So anyway, anything you want to draw with is waiting for you. Anything you want to draw, you should. Or paint. Or do on the computer. You're working on the computer? Everybody doing illustrations on the computer? Sometimes it's nice to get off the screen. I draw on the computer sometimes. It's nice to get off the screen and do it on paper. You have a lot more freedom when you do, you can do this, you know, and just let from the shoulder on, you know, you just draw, and it's a, it's a kind of freedom to it that you don't get when you're we're working on your tablet like that. It's just nice to do that. So, dinner.
Chuck, you taking everybody out? I don't. <laughs> You know, uh, a throughput for this whole conversation has been your concern, A, of the uh, inability to be transgressive in your art or a lessening of that, and B, the fact that a fair number of illustrators, political cartoonists around the world are actually getting dead from practicing their craft. Uh, Erdogan, the uh, prime minister of Turkey, or is he the president? Uh, he had another crackdown. He arrested the editors of, I think it was 40 newspapers and shut down the newspapers and he arrested cartoonists. And I was in, uh, I was on uh, a few years ago, I think it was also 2013, I was in Turkey and I was part of a cartoon panel that was judging international, it was called a kind of international cartoon competition. And I was one of a half a dozen judges. And we were in that country and I met a whole bunch of really great Turkish cartoonists, editorial cartoonists, cartoonists who do books. And they were terrific. And I am certain that a few of them got swept up in this. Um, the, I didn't recognize the name of the guy who I read about in the New York Times, but uh, there were, it said there were other cartoonists. And yeah, I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about us, I'm concerned about political correctness. I'm not really concerned about being murdered for drawing the hairs of the beard of the prophet. But I'm not gonna say it's not possible because you never know who gets upset about these things. So there's, it, it, this kind of thing, the murders of Charlie Hebdo, you know what I'm talking about? The murders of Charlie Hebdo? I knew one of the guys who was murdered. Uh, George Walensky is his name. And he drew mainly funny cartoons, not political cartoons. And he was up there, he went up there that morning, probably had his coffee at a, a local tabac down the street and he had an espresso. He loved his espresso. And, uh, and he went upstairs and he was showing his cartoons and laughing when these two guys, these two murderers burst in. And they weren't like the Ayatollah called them valiant uh, and brave. They were cowards and killers. And they were shouting cartoon slogans in a cartoon manifestation of how they worshiped their God, their cartoon image of the God they had in mind. As they gunned down all these cartoonists, talk about alliteration, four cartoon things in there. And they, uh, and what were they doing? They were cartoonists, and these guys were killers. So, what do you say? You know, well, that's not going to happen here. I don't think. And uh, at least it's not going to happen now. But we have to worry about the other kind of censorship, the kind that says, well, you can't do that, you can't do this, you can't do that. So, I'm speaking. You're going to love this. I'm speaking in two days in uh, Santa Rosa. At, there's a TED conference. It's called TED Sonoma. It's kind of junior TED, TED Junior. And it's, the, it's like the AAA league of TED. And what I'm speaking on is particularly, I'm showing only like uh, 20 images. I'm speaking particularly about the murders of Charlie Hebdo and the wintry chill that's come over uh, illustrators, cartoonists, satirists, their editors and publishers who also don't want to get gunned down. Um, since, since those murders happened in the beginning of 2015, and I selected a bunch of images, and they wrote to me yesterday, and they said, we've looked over, we've got everything set in the deck, ready for your presentation, because um, I dropboxed the whole presentation to them. And they said, but uh, some of the images are very strong, so we think we're gonna have to give a warning to people if they think they have to leave the auditorium before you show your pictures, or if there are children there, and maybe they wanna take the children out. And I started laughing, and I said, 
well, you can do that if you wish, but if you think I'm not going to talk about that from the stage because the irony is incredible, you know, if that's the subject and you're having people leave because you're afraid of the subject, excuse me? So they said, well, uh, let us reconsider. But I'm going to talk about it anyway because I think it's a great example of people being afraid of what? A couple of cartoons. Give me a break. I don't know. I don't have to know everything. I don't, you know, how do you know? I mean, how do you know? I think it changes when we maybe grow up a little bit or loosen up a little bit. We feel that we've gotten all kind of tight about it. What I know is that uh, with the threat in that fatwa to the publishers and editors and anyone who's seen it or read it should be killed instantly. Um, that puts a chill in. If you have an editor, if you're doing a cartoon for an editor and the editor looks at it and thinks, you know, if I publish this, somebody may burst into the office and kill me. Or I could lose my job and the publisher says to the editor, the editor wants it and the publisher says, are you out of your mind? We're not doing that. And so this kind of thing is really throws a chill over all satirical art now. And who knows what will happen when that ignorant, well, I'm trying to edit all the words. What can I call them? Ignorant, megalomaniacal lout from Queens. He's from Queens. Gets into office. Who knows how this country will change? He's not going to pass all these laws himself, but he kind of put a things will change. There's a man who will sue you if you do a drawing that he doesn't like or publish a photo that he doesn't like. He sues for anything. Right? So we have to all go into hiding. All of us. And anyway. Okay. Sure.